Hello, everyone. We're going to get started while people are still getting their lunches uh, because we want to make sure we have enough time for question and answer. I think I know many of you in the room, but I will introduce myself. I'm Naz Modirzadeh. I'm the director of the program on international law and armed conflict here at HLS and a professor of practice. And it is a particular delight to be introducing our speaker for today. Um, I think I have been hoping that we could get him here for at least five years. So we're thrilled to have Professor Gregor Knoll with us uh, to discuss his new book in collaboration with two uh, co-authors. He is a professor of international law at the Department of Law, School of Business, Economics, and Law at Gothenburg University. His research covers migration law, the law of armed conflict, the impact of artificial intelligence on law, and the theory of international law. He held the Pufendorf Chair at Lund University from 2012 to 2016, and together with a group of interdisciplinary colleagues, he has edited and published the part of the project we're going to be talking about here today, War and Algorithm with Roman and Littlefield, and we have a copy of it right here, uh, analyzing emergent forms of warfare from the perspective of critical theory, philosophy, legal studies, and visual studies. So we're really delighted to have him with us today and look forward to the conversation. A few very brief administrative notes. This presentation is being recorded, so you are hereby on notice of that. Uh, please silence your phones if you haven't already. Uh, and we know uh, some of you have class at one, so if you could just be mindful of the noise when you're leaving, that would be great. We'll have about a 30-minute presentation and then open up the floor for comments, engagement, questions, etc. Thank you so much, and welcome to you, Gregor. Thank you so much, Nolas, and thank you as well, Justin, for having me and organizing this. It's really delightful to be able to address you uh, in the lunch break, and I'm so happy about the turnout as well. Um, this is kind of a particular moment for an international lawyer to be discussing these matters. I think we are at a kind of a historical juncture. I'm afraid of huge concepts normally, but I think it's correct to describe this as a historical juncture where we have to reassess how far our power as lawyers, as legal researchers actually takes us. So I'm very happy to be brought into conversation with, with you and your context. I should also acknowledge the important work that Mars, Dustin, and other colleagues are doing in this field. We are following your work very closely from the European side, and it's very important to us that you are doing this work um, here. Now, um, uh, Mars, you have been so kind to, to introduce the edited volume from which my uh, presentation today is going to take its cue. Uh, it is called War and Algorithm, and I contributed a chapter called War by Algorithm, the End of Law, question mark. And this is what is propelling me into today's talk. Um, you might be very well aware of the fact that there has been diplomatic activity around that question, lawmaking activity, if you so wish. Since 2014, we have a process uh, uh, in the framework of the Convention uh, on Certain Conventional Weapons, where experts, um, governmental experts, are meeting and trying to think clearer about the possibility of regulating what is called Lethal Autonomous Weapon Systems, this strange acronym that is brought to us by the initials of these words, words, laws. So the regulation of laws, autonomous systems that can be lethal, is at stake in that discussion. And you're well aware of the political, of the political debate on killer robots. Um, so we would think that, yes, this is an important discussion to be had. These events must be important because they bring together states and civil society to uh, discuss issues of regulation. So looking at the documents that are the outcomes of that process is really intriguing uh, because you would expect that, well, now, you know, lawyers are doing their lawyerly thing. They're trying to conceptualize things, make distinctions, and then they're ultimately passing judgment, what kind of conduct is permitted and what kind of conduct is prohibited. This is the kind of DNA that is running us as lawyers, and you would think it would come to play even in the discussion on laws. Now, if you look a bit more closely into the documents rather early on, um, 
kind of a conceptual quicksand seems to bog down the work of the experts that are gathering in these meetings. Um, actually, on a proposal by a civil society organization, Article 36, the NGO, uh, the concept of meaningful human control was brought into the discussion. The idea being that, well, lethal autonomous weapon systems are probably not that bad or not that unacceptable if we only can show that they can be brought under meaningful human control. So we do have this tension here between the human and the machine. And here is a concept that we are throwing into a legal regulation debate that seems to do some work and that seems to fortify the role of the human, the lawyer, uh, and the human judgment. That's all very nicely intended, I think. But if you just take a pause for a moment and think about what we are doing with that concept in that particular context, meaningful human control of systems that are described as lethal autonomous weapon systems, I mean, you have to decide. Either something is autonomous and then it is beyond control, or it is heteronymous and then it is within control. So having meaningful human control over laws would actually make them into laws. The autonomous would go away, or uh, it would need to be re replaced by, by heteronymous. So what we are doing in such a process is trying to regulate autonomous systems that turn out not to be autonomous systems after all. And that's, of course, something we would describe otherwise as a performative self-contradiction. It's not very nice if that performative self-contradiction lasts a couple of years and holds captive the public imagination making uh, the ordinary woman and man on the street think that regulatory work is actually being achieved where it is in reality not achieved, but made impossible by an erroneous conceptualization of the problem. So if you want to get depressed at this point, be my guest. Um, this is the trade I'm dealing in. Now, let us then take a step back and ask what questions have we been asking to the field all the time? We've been focusing on killer robots. We've been focusing on these platforms, these devices. We've been focusing on their lethality and their automaticity, to use another word which I think is more accurate uh, uh, and better depicts reality. And we've been seeing campaigns against killer robots and so on and so on. Perhaps this has been to bark up the wrong tree. Perhaps this is a debate that used cognitive resources which could have been better spent. So I would like to argue that instead of looking at a choice between human control or machine control, we should take as our point of departure that we are having an amalgamation of human and machine, which is a kind of a point of departure, which we would need to think through. We would need to think through whether we at all can regulate that amalgamation where humans and machines come together in assemblages. And you might be thinking, what am I talking about until I do this and open my smartphone and say, well, here is a human machine assemblage, is it not? And it's clearly impacting on my conduct, but it's less clear who is in charge here me or my smartphone when I'm organizing my life, trying to get back to New York this afternoon, for example. So this can be a very mundane description of what a human machine assemblage is. But add a little bit of complexity, but not too much, as Nas can tell you. And you actually have transposed yourself into a military field where the problem is not getting back to New York City uh, at a certain point in time, but the problem is to take out enemy combatants. And um, you're essentially basing yourself on the same human as machine assemblage. So what I propose is that we are researching this human machine assemblage. And we're asking the question, can it be subjected to the law? This is where we should start. 
not with the question, should we outlaw killer robots as such? I think that's the wrong debate, exactly the wrong debate. The right debate would be had, okay, if we have human machine assemblages, if we are living in that age, does that mean giving in to the power of algorithms? Or is there a way of putting some form of law on top again? And if there is a way, is it the law in the way we keep thinking of the law since a couple of millennia? Or is there something more of an effort and more of a creative effort demanded of us in our generation? OK, let me try to be a bit illustrative. So what I'm trying to do here is I'm saying assemblage human and machine. When I'm saying machine, I'm thinking of an algorithmic machine. I'm thinking of artificial intelligence and digitalization. So let me, let me allow me to use a couple of shorthands. And those of you who are knowledgeable in computer sciences will surely have good reasons to correct the way I'm expressing myself. So basically, the conflict is this. Within the assemblage, we have two poles. We have the, ru the rule of code, as in artificial intelligence. And we have the rule of code, as in the rule of law. Because, well, codification is something we lawyers know something about, is it not? So we are, in a sense, doing something that our friends in computer science are also doing. We're codifying things. They're codifying things. They're running code. We are running code, if you stretch the metaphor a little bit. So here we have a tension that plays out in that human-machine assemblage. But it's not that AI and law are standing against each other. Each comes with a certain baggage of thinking if you permit. So I'd need to frame this and say, AI, where does it come from? Historically, it comes from cybernetics. And we're right at the core if we're talking about military applications, because cybernetics, after all, historically um, was experiencing a surge in the 40s and the 50s with military problems like calculating the path of artillery, uh, solving the problems of cipher, and so on and so on. So come to us as people dealing with the laws of war, and you're coming to people who are actually quite close, historically, to cybernetic thought. Right, law is not without history either. And in order to make the story a bit more juicy at this moment, let me just identify law with monotheism. Let me just say that. We've been thinking in terms of written law and its implementation in life. So it's perhaps not too much of a stretch to say that this follows a script of monotheism, by and large, that is now being secularized. So we have these two traditions of thought. One is a bit more recent, and um, the other is a bit more dated. There are important differences between them. We need to tease them out in order to think more clearly about them. Good. In the article, or in the chapter I provided to the book, I asked the question, um, is it possible to subject algorithmic forms of warfare to the rule of law? So I've been asking the classical question of a lawyer who tries to subordinate a phenomenon uh, out there in the world to the rule of law. Uh, but I'm not trying you know, to shoehorn this in. I'm uh, humble, um, faced with the possibility of failure, faced with the poss poss possibility of law's failure to subject AI to its rule. I'd say, let's be humble. Let's look what this looks like. Let's look how huge the problem is in reality. OK. Let me just run you through the argument the book is making and then focus on one particular uh, aspect, one particular argument, the one I'm most worried about. And let me share that with you uh, uh, over the remain, uh, remaining part of my talk. So when I'm asking the question, is it possible to subject algorithmic forms of warfare to the rule of law? Uh, I'm coming to the conclusion, uh, spoiler warning here, that no, it's not possible. And this I do because there are a couple of dis uh, things that make algorithmic systems distinct from non-algorithmic systems, weapon systems here, in my case. 
And I can see four elements. There is this cybernetic assumption here that um, all forms of life, be they taking place in a human, in an animal, or a machine, all forms of life are governable according to the same normative ideas. So you can actually break down the complex reality and rich, richness of life, natural life, to units that then can be researchable and shown to be following more or less the same script. So cybernetics, uh, from Greek, the Greek term Kubernetes, the oarsman, is the science of steering natural life, if you so wish. Right, that makes a difference. So the cybernetic assumption that animals, including humans and machines, are the same in terms of control and communication, that's an assumption that monotheism certainly doesn't make. If you are, con if you are um, familiar with Christian doctrine, you would immediately associate to uh, the dominium which the Lord passed over to humans uh, to govern the world. Um, there's a kind of a privileged position for the human in the human universe of things and so on and so on. So here's a difference. So if we have a monotheistic tradition of law, secular law that nevertheless uses the, the uh, cognitive resources of monotheism, uh, we might have a conflict here that it is worth to think about. Second, um, in more sophisticated military systems, um, you have a learning component. The system, so if you wish, authors itself. It studies the world itself, of course, set on track by human beings, by programmers, and drawing on curated data. But it is given the resources to learn by itself, and that's actually the very point of machine learning, to leapfrog what human programmers otherwise would need to have been doing. So this great project of making the human superfluous in cognitive terms. Um, and it's certainly impressive in a sense, but it creates regulatory problems because you take the human cognition out of the loop in a way that makes it difficult to later on affix uh, uh, consciousness to the human and therewith the possibility of culpability, of liability, of uh, responsibility under the law. So there's a second difference here, which we are running up to. Third, um, AI is built very, to a very important degree on connectionist assumptions. It makes an assumption here that uh, our possibility to research uh, uh, natural life lies in tracking the strength of connections which are thought of as neural connections. So the brain of living beings and uh, uh, the, the processes taking place in artificially intelligent pro systems are analogous in a way here um, that are stretching far back into this cybernetic equalization of life across different forms of life, human, animal, or machinic. No such stuff here. I mean, law is looking for a human brain that is sufficiently capable uh, to, to cognize uh, risks, dangers, possible courses of events that is capable of exercising precaution in a military context that is capable to make a risk assessment so as to decide not to bomb or not to engage a certain target and so on and so on. Finally, um, the, well, let me just stay with that for a moment um, with this connectionism. Uh, the issue of connectionism is also that AI would think, and a person using AI to research the world would think that AI helps me to make truth emerge. It helps me to bring out the true nature of things in a way that I do not have alternative strategies to with researching. My own brain power is not enough, so I need the machine in order to, to get at that reality. So AI is resting on a thinking without cognitive alternatives. And that's the difficult thing here, uh, is showing to us that we really have entered into a kind of a symbiosis with our machines. 
and it's not easy for us to find our way back to uh, the railway station without part of that assemblage. But it's also got to do with the fact that we no longer have access to that historical phase where we may do without the assemblage. Right. Finally, uh, in these four elements, um, we have a problem if we do have an algorithmic system that would kind of help us to target militarily on a larger scale, how would we be able to assess whether that system is working in the right way, in a legal way? That's very hard because we do not have a kind of a parallel history minus AI with which we can compare. As soon as these systems are used in the world and they're impacting on the historical situation we're living in, you no longer have something to compare with. So you're hard pressed to say, well, in the ordinary course of events, this would be illegal or this would be legal because there is no ordinary course of events. Parallel to that, the debate on Star Wars in the US in the 1970s and 80s, where concerned uh, physicists who were taking part as experts in that debate said, well, we would like to test these computer systems that are designed to intercept incoming nuclear missiles shot up by the Soviet Union, but we can't because the system is so terribly complex, you would need a separate planet for an empirical study where you would shoot missiles at each other and try to intercept them. We don't have that spare Earth. It's a trite argument, but it's very compelling in itself. The same argument uh, uh, actually pops up again in the context of AI and law. Now, um, those were the four elements. Let me now simply to, to end up focus on one particular aspect that I'm very concerned about. And that is the sequence we are used to employ when we are coming from the monotheistic legal uh, uh, paradigm. And that doesn't really seem to work when we are uh, working through a human machine assemblage. Now, if you allow me to take you back to antiquity just for a little moment, and I'll try to make this as brief as possible, um, just to clear our thoughts on where we are coming from. So uh, let's go back to times where the law couldn't be distinguished from the ruler who was spelling it out. Um, let us be guided by, by Jan and Aleida Asman, the German cultural theorists who take us back to uh, Hammurabi, the person of Hammurabi, the person who was behind the Codex Hammurabi in antiquity, which we always think of as a codex, but the two Asmans are educating us to think of Hammurabi as a person who incarnates the law. Hammurabi is the law. There's no point in talking about the law beyond the person of the ruler, because the moment the ruler changes his or her mind, well, the law changes as well. So why would you want to make that distinction? That's the point of departure. Nomos empsychos, or lex animata, uh, the incarnated law, the law that is incarnated in the ruler. That's the point of departure. Now comes monotheism and changes everything. The very point of the law is now that it's excarnate, it's written, it is passed down to humans by a non-human agent, a divine agent of sorts. So the very point here, the Asmans underscore, is that it's written, it's enforced because it is written. It's detached from humans. That's giving, it, that's giving it normative validity. So we're now entering, with the advent of the Abrahamic religions, with monotheism, we're entering into a long phase, and I would argue one that lasts, although we are considering ourselves to be secularized, a long phase where the idea is that we are receiving law, written law, by a sovereign of sorts, could be divine, could be a secular sovereign as well, we are sitting down to study that law. Here are the libraries, here are the institutions to do that. We are at a law school and we are then going out of that door and implementing the law in real life. We're running into all kinds of problems, so we're going back to the study and trying to get a better grasp of what the law really means and we're going back to life and so on and so on. So this sequence
written law, the human study, and human implementation. This is at the core of what a monotheistic script does with law. It's in force because it's written. We have to study it. Nothing may be added or sub subtracted. Um, it's a very strong norm, the Asman's underscore. And then we're implementing it. We're studying it again. We're implementing it. All the work you are doing on legal cases falls squarely within that description. Um, you're studying these cases because they are expressions of the written law. And you're trying to kind of extrapolate what these cases mean to future cases. You're implementing the law into the future. You're running into problems. You're going back to study iter iteratively. In that sense, Harvard Law School is no different from the madrasas, the yeshivots, uh, 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 the monastery schools that were institutions built up around that uh, script of written law, human study, human implementation. Now you see where I'm coming. This is, of course, something that is profoundly called into question by this. As soon as we add the assemblage to the mi mixture, you see that things get messy to a very large degree. Okay, who is assuming the, or what is assuming the position of written law? Well, you'd be inclined to say code, but well, wait a minute, code is man-made. So this idea of code being excarnate at the beginning doesn't really hold water. It's incarnate. It's the human flesh here uh, that is already coming in. So it's messy, but what are we trying to achieve when we're coding and letting the code go out on a data set that is the world and bring back something to us that we haven't known before. Well, again, we are actually studying, studying natural life. So it starts with a com completely different point of departure, does it not? So the object of whatever we are studying is different here. The normative foundation is different that merits some thoughts. That's really fundamental. So if you would like to speak about an epical shift taking place where we're moving out of millennia of monotheism, I think you would be justified to think about it in those terms because the foundation, the very script we're following has been changed. So we're moving from natural life to study. But what happened to study? Study has also been excarnated. Study would normally be the point where the excarnate law would be incarnated, would be pushed through the flesh out into life of the world. It doesn't really work like that because the very idea with having algorithmic technologies is that they are studying the world for us. We are sending them out to uh, research a data set for us. Yes, we are at the beginning of that process, but we are not there when the work of study, when the cognitive work is done. We are absent. Google Maps is doing the work for me when I'm trying to find my back, way back to the station. The algorithmic system is doing the cognitive work when uh, a military seeks to identify who is a combatant and who is a civilian. So there is something going on in this study here that we really can't capture with the concept of human study. So there's an amalgamation going on here. There's again, the assemblage is showing, uh, uh, showing its real muscles. And we can't subsume what is taking place here under the old uh, uh, script. Now, what about implementation? And have bearing with me if I'm stretching the imagination a bit here. I mean, implementation of the law, you might say, this is not implementing the law, this is implementing something else. Well, but it is implementing something that has such a normative power that is so informative of our conduct in the world. So, when it comes to implementation, the same thing is happening. We can't say it's human implementation. If we want to exploit the advantages that machine learning is giving to us, we have to let the machine 
give us advice that we can't completely understand. So we have to invest our faith into the machine rather than following each and every cognitive step and being phenomenally there when the machine is starting to implement uh, uh, the, 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 the knowledge it has amassed during the study of the data set on a new data set. So we are not really absent, but neither are we really present here. So this whole idea that the two Asmans gave to us, that the law is so much about making the excarnate incarnate, pushing it through the human flesh into reality, it's gone here. The meta metaphor doesn't hold because what flesh is there in the human machine assemblage? That brings us back to the old problem that we have to split the assemblage into two and say who is the human and who is the machine. That's exactly not the right formulation of the problem. That's exactly the, the formulation of the problem that brings us to killer robot, stop killer robots campaigns. Nothing wrong in them. They might seem to be the right political choice. I don't believe that is the case right now. I think we need to do the difficult work first. And it's tempting to do the easy work or by saying, let's have a ban. But asking for a ban doesn't help us if we don't know what exactly we are banning. And that's where we lose it to forces that kind of outsmart us on the, on the conceptual work, I would say. This was not in my script, but I feel it's important <laughs> to say. <laughs> right. Now, I think my time is running out here. Do I have more to say? Yes, I think I have more to say. Um, of course, I always have more to say. Why are you laughing, by the way? Anyway, good. Where does this take us? Where does this take us, the difference between the monotheistic and the cybernetic sequence of uh, making, uh, studying, and implementing law? Well, I think it takes us to a position cognitively where we don't where we are unable to take a step back and look at what we are doing. We are unable to take a step back and say, well, our human judgment is that this conduct is unlawful. Because we have actually handed over the cognitive resources to a part of the assemblage that we cannot do without uh, to understand the world. So there is no independent judgment outside the assemblage, outside the human machine assemblage. That's creating all kinds of problems, but the most important problem it creates um, within the old paradigm of law, which is after all the paradigm I'm speaking of, is that it makes it impossible to do what we call appeal. A uh, bearing idea of legal systems is that we can appeal against judgments that are made. So we can put them, again, as a kind of a novel case for scrutiny by a different independent instance that has a fresh look at it. And as you see, to the extent we have made ourselves dependent of the cognitive resources um, of artificial intelligence, there is no stepping outside of that human machine assemblage. There is no independence. Uh, there is no kind of third view, if you so wish, that can take a fresh look at things. That places the outcome of these cognitive processes, of these judgmental processes, because it could mean life or death for a person who is erroneously classified as a combatant. Um, it places them beyond appeal. And if we are in a situation where judgments are made that are beyond appeal, the law, the secular law, has come to an end. And I think I'm ending here. Thank you for your attention. Thank you so much. I, I don't generally like to give dramatic introductions because I feel it's unfair to say this person is known to be an amazing speaker and an energizing voice. I think I can say now, um, for those of you who didn't know Gregor before, uh, characteristically, not only engaging and energizing, but I think uh, creative and giving us a tremendous amount to think about. With that, let me open the floor for questions. I'm going to run this microphone around so that we can pick up your voices. Uh, and I'll open the floor now. Yes. 
Thank you very much. <coughs> this is fascinating. Uh, so, I think it's very important that you started the story of AI with cybernetics. And in, in usual accounts of AI, at least in these conversations, people don't necessarily specifically stress the cybernetic aspect uh, of it. Um, and it's important because cybernetics in some ways is much more interesting and rich than the cognitive science theory and the philosophy underpinning a lot of artificial intelligence work today, uh, especially associated with the connectivist aspect and or the symbolic representation aspect that you addressed that came out of the so-called good old fashioned AI from the 50s to the 90s and even the neural network side. Because cybernetics on the one hand had a formalization of information aspect, which was linking with the Claude Shannon work, but on the other, on the other uh, hand, had also a very important right, um, amalgamation of individuals and machines and technologies environmental aspect, which was taken on by a lot of cybernetic thinking in the 60s, 70s, 80s, and so on. And my question, and, and Norbert Wiener himself, had been influenced by, to some extent, quantum theory and such scientific theories that are much more you know, complex than the artificial intelligence cognitive thinking that we are dealing with today. So my question is whether you think that in cybernetic thinking there is a, an idea of thinking of human machine connectivity that is richer and more, um, you know, provides more sort of points of engagement from a law perspective and whether it points us to ways of thinking that to some extent challenges perhaps the individualist aspects of law and legal agency and the agency in judgment, which might be a way forward beyond the impasse that you so clearly described. Is it okay if I take more than one? And then Absolutely. Come back to you? Okay. Let me just hope that I can remember. Yeah. <laughs> Unless you didn't take question. notes, and then we'll sure. take one more question, and then I'll give Gergo back for it. Yes, on my way. Sorry, did you were you next? I don't know. Oh, okay. <laughs> Sorry. Sorry. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you, Professor, for your talk. It was very interesting. I also agree that. Um, what you were explaining about the difference between how we structure law and how AI is structured is the fundamental difference uh, and you know problem with us trying to regulate it as we tried everything else beforehand. Um, I just wanted to know if you have any thoughts on, considering that's how you frame the question, what is the next step on how we can actually regulate AI? So because it is so different from our monotheistic view of law, how can we actually frame law in a way to actually help us um, regulate AI that would uh, encompass the structure that you told us, it would make more sense. Was that a clear? Very clear. Yeah. Yep. Back to you. Thank you so much to both of you for pertinent questions. Yes, of course, I do think the cybernetic, the tradition of that cybernetic thought is really rich uh, in assumptions and that we are only starting to appreciate what kind of resources we find there. I think it's a bit parallel to, to um, colleagues researching uh, uh, the history of liberalism and going back to the resources that are to be found in uh, the Vienna School and order liberal thinking and all kinds of stuff and you can kind of pull lines then onwards uh, to contemporary events and actually compute the empirical events back to things that have been thought in the 20s. And there's Lovo Remlid who is, who is excelling in that discipline. But um, I, 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 uh, your question was more specific, namely whether this would kind of invite us to overcome the individualistic accounts that are so prevalent in law and uh, consider whether it's a viable alternative to, to think in more collective terms. And that's a kind of a um, dangerous moment, isn't it? Because uh, we're not fully aware of what we are doing if we are saying yes to a more behavioristic paradigm, a paradigm that says, um, yes, let's, you know, um, let's amass the phenomena 
and see what kind of normativity we can get out of that. That's precisely where in the quantitative, where the great power of, of cybernetic thought lies, because you've enlarged uh, the, 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 the number of agents that can be indicative for whatever normativity is in life from being just humans to a wider swath of, of agents. So I do think you are, you are really pointing us into an important direction here. But I feel so under-equipped at this stage of answering the question honestly whether we're just playing a dangerous game at our own peril or whether we actually can play that game and come out as winners. Now, the we is a kind of a idea of the lawyer as a normative agent here uh, who can pull and not pull back, pull over um, regulatory issues into a field where the political isn't already consumed by what seems to be the technical. So, yeah, so I, it's a kind of a non-liquid answer, I'm sorry. But you're very right to, to invite us to, to consider exactly that question. Basically, it's a, it's a kind of a simplifying translation for my own sake would be, is there any good AI? Is there a revolutionary AI, for example? Is there a social transformational AI? And certainly we can see applications that there are. Um, I'm just thinking about this great application of um, a legal advice uh, application for asylum seekers developed by, I think, a, a West Coast students way back, who has then morphed it into a uh, commercially successful app that can uh, appeal against, against parking fines. So out goes the social impetus and incomes commercialization and things do change. And the question is, does capitalism always win in technology or can it be unmoored from capitalism? But let me get back to your important question, um, which was, what is the next step? How do we regulate if we regulate at all? And that's really where I think our cognitive resources should be invested. That's really where we should be. The only thing we should deny ourselves is this simple idea that, yes, yes, we bring it together a number of states and lobby them, like with the landmines prohibition. And at the end, there will be a kind of an Ottawa moment where we succeed and we have a convention and the problem is more or less solved. That's not on the cards. That's not a choice. So I, I'm kind of undermining my own professional position as an international lawyer by saying that the traditional protocols of changing the world might not apply. And the question is, if you are with me that this being brought together in a melange, and that's my point, I'm not saying this is dominating this. I'm certainly not saying this is dominating this. But I'm saying it's a melange, it's an assemblage, it's mixed. Um, it, of course, keeps us in the game in a way which would suggest that if we only would muster the creativity, if we only would muster the, 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 the kind of the intellectual resources to bring ourselves back into a conversation with this field and say, hey, you have a legitimacy that stretches back a couple of decades, and that is very fraught. Let's fight the first war with AI systems, and people will have a kind of an atomic bomb moment where the legitimacy of your work will be called into question. And then you are coming running and saying, let's do atoms for peace. Let's liaise with civil society. Let's you know, offer all kinds of benefits just for loving us. And let's preempt that moment and let's think whether we can make politics uh, on that level. Um, but it's really hard because we can't say we're offering you the legitimacy brought upon you by traditional law. Because, as we discussed in the run-up to, to this meeting, Nas and me, they might not be interested in that traditional legitimacy. They might be imagining themselves to be creating their own legitimacy. So the real question is how to enter into the conversation with the well-meaning persons in that field and say, what does regulation mean? What does the idea of regulation mean? It can't mean just to certify applications and say, well, this is a safe application for having a kind of a international armed conflict. It must be something else. Let's talk about that and let's talk not with lawyers, but let's talk across disciplines. So I'm only 
giving procedural advice, and this is an advice you'd probably be able to give yourself, but I'm, I'm, I'm emphatically saying let's not hope for a kind of a supervening power of the written law in that situation. Historically, that moment is over. Ah, I like to be dramatic, don't I? <laughs> I'm going to go back here, and then I'll come around the room. Sorry. I feel like I'm a talk show host here. <laughs> there we go. Thanks a lot. Uh, thank you so much for the talk. That was really, really inspiring. And it's very um, refreshing, I feel, in particular here, to have someone who sort of enters a discussion embracing complexity and sort of thinking about what you might not know in a scholarly culture, where I feel that that is uncommon. So that was very, very nice to see. Um, I have one little, this is not my area of study, but I, I, I was sort of, I'm curious to hear what you have to say about the, so on the, on the blackboard to the right here for me, <laughs> um, I was thinking about all these dichotomies, and I had a little sense that in the beginning, with the, by invoking the metaphor of the assemblage, you were sort of trying to move away a little from that dichotomy, or that, I mean, the mere metaphor of an assemblage sort of says that it's not man or machine only, it's something in that mix. So I was wondering, could you somehow tease out, are there connections between the written law and natural life? Or are there like s sort of interrelations between human study and study by this machine or could you could you link those in some sort of ways to to add to kind of make that metaphor work in the right part of the blackboard as well All if that makes sense as a question yes, sure. but something along those lines would be cool to yeah. to hear because otherwise if you just shift to the second like the underlying line then you have this picture of the machine that just implements meaning killing someone yeah. but if you if you say oh it's something in that mix I think, I mean, it sounds like you are, that, that would be a cool, I mean, if you have ideas along those lines, it would be cool to hear. So, Good. thanks. Thank you so much. Oh, yeah, you want to take another question? Do you yeah. mind? I'll take Try to one remember. more round and then come back to it. Yeah. Hello. Thank you so much for your talk. It was very fascinating. And Luve is actually one of my colleagues, and we have a lot of um, interesting ways of thinking that are similar, even though we study very different topics. <laughs> So I actually study the interaction between um, technology and global governance. So I'm really fascinated by um, the way you've structured um, a way to understand uh, war and algorithms, which is something I don't know that much about myself. But um, so my question might be sort of similar to Luva's. Um, so one thing I just wanted to note first was that aside from this human machine assemblage part that I think you're saying is something that distinguishes AI from law um, in this context. There's also this temporal dimension of the ex post versus an ex ante decision making and implementation. And uh, so I think maybe in the AI context, there's sort of an ex ante decision making and implementation beforehand. And then when and how can that get challenged? And then the other uh, aspect is with regard to law. Um, law tends to be sort of backward looking, I mean, in the traditional understanding. So is there something in that relationship that you would say is something that distinguishes the two? Um, and then the other question was, um, in assuming this binary between AI and law, are we overlooking the interaction and how they shape each other? So how does law inform the development of AI and how does AI inform the development of law? Thank you. Gregor, if it's okay, I'm going to take one more, yes. and then we'll come back to you. Um, I had a brief follow-up to this question um, and another one as well. I was also a little bit confused about um, when we were willing to concede that there was this human-machine cooperation happening and when we removed it from the narrative. For example, I thought in the second line you could also similarly say it's not a study, but uh, still a human study that's in the hands of the actual programmer who's writing the algorithms, yeah. or the person who similarly is taking out the phone and deciding when or when not a machine would apply. Yeah. Um, and similarly, I, your concept in the beginning with how meaningful human control from Article 3, 36 might undermine 
the actual conceptual thought of autonomy itself. I wasn't sure how similarly this hu human machine cooperation system that you're putting forth wouldn't also kind of undermine that idea of autonomy. Um, and then my second question was if you think, because I agree with you that these conversations, like clearly the law, because of some of these like underlying assumptions, can't really come up to speed with AI and weapon systems. Um, but then, and that we have to have a conversation really on what regulation looks like. But then wouldn't you say that there's value in a ban in and of itself to just put a pause on any sort of development and arms race that might be happening so that way we're not introducing weapon systems in a world in which we have no form of regulation or no conversation? Because otherwise we do get into this kind of post facto discussion of, yes, we face the consequences, but none of our law or systems are actually up to speed to deal with them. Yeah. Fantastic, over to you. My God, um, I had no idea this would be so hard. Um, uh, da, 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 da. Can I be permitted to work my way backwards from you to you to you? Is that okay? Um, because of course the question, time is politics. This is what we are essentially saying. The ban, the advantage of the ban is to say, well, let's take a pause for thought. Um, the question here is whether the price at which this pause for thought comes is not too high. Because we are then saying we know what is wrong. We can put the finger on it and we want it banned. And that ban creates a kind of a pause for thought. Um, I would just like to think the possibility of saying we don't know what is wrong with these weapons yet. I, and so we can't say what is right with them, why they are not wrong. So it applies to both sides. And um, the, the, the uh, question of banning it would be a boundless question, wouldn't it? Because if we don't know exactly what we're banning, then we're banning a kind of a very, very wide uh, array of human practices in the human machine assemblages as well. So what I'm trying to get at is that we're running into this very same problem of drawing the line that we are using to, in a way, indict the use of these systems as something being beyond uh, our, our kind of traditional way of thinking legal control, legal regulation. And we're running into exactly the same re reproach that we're trying to turn against the persons, the agents wishing to use these systems at the earliest point possible. So there's a kind of a, I think there's a kind of an argumentative hygiene at stake here where we need to be very careful in the formulation why we would like to think without hugging the, uh, without, sorry, without splitting the Gordian knot of the assemblage uh, beforehand. But I'm not a political activist, so I'm not, I, I say that with humility and not with uh, uh, kind of a, um, a sarcasm here. Um, I don't know how these things are to be done so that humans actually can adhere to them as a political project. But I would, I never wished so dearly in my life that I would be capable of doing that. So, good, let me try to work backwards from there. Uh, your earlier leg, the earlier leg of your question was whether um, the human machine assemblage and the question of meaningful human control, I understand you to say, aren't they the same thing? Yes, they are the same thing. They are kind of uh, suffering from the same instability. I can explain that ex instability in theoretical terms. If you allow me now uh, just a minute to remind you of the fact that in the Christian tradition, we had enormous problems, and I'm saying this we as a secularized person, we had enormous problems in telling God and the human apart. We had this particular problem that we happened to have a human who nevertheless was the son of God. How do we draw the line? How do we depict that person? There are Christian traditions, dogma, dogmatic traditions saying, don't do that, you will forever get it wrong. And you look at the human machine assemblage and you say, same, same, but different. It's the same thing that turns up now again. We are running into something where we are having a black box that so destabilizes our conceptual work in the same way as the black box of the divine used to destabilize our conceptual work in theology. 
when, when do I find the time to do that, that kind of work? But I think it's material for getting stuff right in the secular domain. So let me try to go back to your question and see whether I can reconstruct it. Oh, help me. Remind me of what the so gist what of your question is. Aside from the human machine assemblage that you're saying is distinguishing these two things, uh, is it also the temporal aspect yes. of when decision making is taking place and when there's a um, possibility for appeal or not and things like that? So yes. that was the first part. And the second part was in looking at these things as two separate boxes. Um, are we overlooking the interaction between law and technology, yes. how law shapes technology, how technology shapes law? Of course. Thank you very much. I'm sorry for my... I couldn't read my own notes, basically. <laughs> um, the temporal is very good. I think that's very apt for, for uh, analyzing it because, I mean, time is a political resource, as I just saw, saw it fit to underline. And I think um, in this kind of extremely simplified and oversimplified uh, uh, scheme, what we're forgetting is that these two are running to a different temporal logic um, and their iterations taking place. Is there, there are loops here connecting human study and human implementation. And of course, there are loops between study and implementation and assemblage systems as well. But they are so much more complex to describe. So I wouldn't want to put them on the blackboard, but I do think they are pertinent to the discussion. So trying to connect now the lady who asked the question with the NASA t-shirt has already gone, but trying to connect your two questions to each other. Um, it's exactly in that proceduralization of this, of what the assemblage does, which is actually, and this is the answer to your comment, it stitches across, it stitches together these two patterns in a way that is rather complex, but it merits to be disassembled. It merits to take one particular AI application and say, okay, let's look very calmly at how this is supposed to work, how this is supposed to be uh, kind of certified against reality, uh, evaluated against reality, um, and let's look at the temporalities that are built into that. And I think there are simple points to be gleaned. For example, temporal constraints put on development by military developers uh, uh, sorry, by developers, by the military on developers. Mars, you've made me aware of that. The rules that are applying to, to, to developers for applications for uh, that the US military is taking interest in their extremely short time spans. Um, and that's a temporality that is kind of flying in our face. But then things might get more complex if we are being more granular in our analysis. In terms of methodologies, I think it's there we need to enlarge our register. It's there we need to become more interdisciplinary, in a sense, and educate ourselves to be able to be part of those conversations and asking the right question. Not to program, not that kind of stuff. We just need to uphold a conversation with the programmers so that they think we're intelligent beings. And I think that's also part of, of a kind of a larger coalition building exercise that I would propose to be necessary here. And again, it's easy to get it wrong and say, well, yes, you know, the lawyer told me as a programmer that this would be okay. It's not at that level because the programmer might not understand what you just said and misinterpret it. So we have to educate each other here across the disciplines. So that was temporality. Let me speed up because I see now that I have a temporal problem as well. Um, the interactions, which is basically also your question, is it really legitimate from a research point of view to put it out as a stark difference? And I probably have come across uh, 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 in a kind of an oversimplifying way because I, I want this natural life study and implementation to be uh, applying to the assemblage. Um, and I want this to be unstable. I don't want this to be so straightforward as I presented the monotheistic script. <laughs> so um, I would say that there is a lot of instability built into this. And if I uh, came across otherwise, I apologize for that. Um, and this would also kind of uh, be part of that study program. Um, if we're looking at single applications 
where do you see that there is a kind of an old school thinking at work or where do you see that there's cybernetic thinking at work? Um, can you identify these points? Can you show how the conversation is structured? That would seem to be incredibly important. So I'm all for work at the micro level now, smallish studies, single applications, a finite group of decision makers, talk to them, understand them. Um, that's what I would like to do, time and space permitting. Thank you so much. It's always a good sign of a lunchtime talk when we go over in engaging and not in, in giving a speech. Uh, I think both in celebration of human study and also of what we don't know and find complex. Uh, please join me in thanking Gregor Noll for this wonderful presentation. Thank you very much.